markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Welcome to Chat with Traders, episode 227. This time, we are deviating a little bit from the regular format, as I'd like to start doing some occasional trade recap episodes. So just as it sounds, the idea here being that I bring on a guest purely to step through the ins and outs of how they executed one specific trade, from forming a trade idea, initiating a position, managing it, and then finally getting out the other end. And the first to do it is Chase Galbraith. He is an Australian equities trader who's most active in small caps. The trade in focus today took place between September and November 2021 in mineral exploration company Kingrose Mining. The ASX ticker or symbol is KRM. So I would categorize this particular trade as a swing trade, largely driven by fundamentals, but it also incorporates tape reading and price action around execution too. Now, a couple things that you should know, KRM is a sub 10 cent stock. So what that means on the Australian market, sub 10 cent stocks trade in tenths of a cent. So for example, when you hear us referencing the price as 4.5, etc., this is 4.5 cents, not $4.50. And if you go to the show notes at chatwithtraders.com slash 227, you'll see a price chart with an overlay of Chase's executions and running p and etc. So it might be helpful to pull this up and have it in front of you while you're listening. Finally, please remember that none of this is financial advice. As I always say, you are entirely responsible for your own trading decisions. All right. Hope you enjoy this one. Here is Chase Galbraith. How did this stock get your attention? How did it appear on your radar? I'd been watching this stock for a while. I traded it like years ago when it was like a predominantly a gold stock. It was producing mine in Indonesia. And then uh, earlier this year, they refreshed the board and the management team and they um, appointed a, a guy by the name of Fabian Baker who he um, sold, uh, he Tethian Resources, which was listed on the TSX. He sold that company to um, Adriatic, which is one company that I follow on the Australian Stock Exchange. So I'd followed pretty much Fabian across from Tethian and then into King Rose when he was appointed as managing director. So I was kind of watching it and seeing what uh, what his role would be there if they were to continue to, with the Way Lingo mine or they were going to look to... Um, go to an explorer route and maybe acquire different assets because he's got a lot of experience in um, North, um, sorry, um, in Europe. So I was just keeping an eye on, I think that was about in February um, of 2021. So he was appointed in Feb and then there was probably about six months of, um, I'm guessing, some due diligence on projects in that period of time. And then they looked like they were getting more serious towards um, that August, September period. They'd, they'd rebranded the company um, all their, you know, all their marketing information, and they'd put out a new presentation. I think in September, so that's when it, it got brought back into my attention. A couple of um, really intelligent dudes on on Twitter that I follow that um, they were also following and kind of suggested to me that it was definitely worth keeping an eye on. So I was just at that time, I was just watching into that August period. Okay, so it was a company that you had sort of you were fairly familiar with its history. Yeah, familiar with the asset that they were um, previously working on, which was uh, they'd kind of gone for they were the mine itself was on care and maintenance, so it was it wasn't producing any cash flow or anything. They were trying to uh, they were trying to like uh, infer some more resources. They were doing some active drilling. They were trying to uh, find uh, some uh, the the resource that they were mining at the time had some water ingress, and they they um, closed down the mine and then look, went out inside and tried to drill a few more targets to define more resources outside of that area. So it was kind of um, in a bit of no man's land whilst they found new resources and they kind of um, chose a new direction. So I, I wasn't trading at all. I didn't have a position in it during that time. But when they looked to uh, 
go down a different route of, of mergers and acquisitions or it's just, yeah, that's when I started becoming more interested in the story again. Okay. So is this something that you do quite often or is, is sort of a big part of how you trade is understanding the fundamentals, um, you know, some of the management, the projects that um, are behind a company? Yeah, I, I think because I'm not a good, uh, purely a technical trader, I feel as if I need to have like a decent understanding of the fundamentals before I can develop like a, a, enough conviction and idea to, to go and put full size on the trade. I, I feel like I have to understand at least like the basic fundamentals, the direction on like if, if it's going to be like the gold sector at the moment, for instance, doesn't really excite the market. So I don't want to be stuck in a, in a company that's going down that kind of route when they revise their, direction and they started looking down that battery minerals path i guess that was the kind of um the blinker to start looking more deeply at what their what their new direction is because uh, like they could have gone on and and uh, spent their 30 million dollars of cash on drilling the gold resource but it wouldn't have attracted the same kind of attention in the market that going down that whole battery minerals um route that seems to attract you know those blue sky valuations that you're seeing at the moment Sometimes we see, especially in uh, these smaller cap stocks, is they will uh, almost pivot or they'll announce that they are moving into uh, sort of the, the flavor of the month or, or yeah. the sector that's hot at the moment. Um, was there anything about this which made you fi- which made you gave you the confidence this is, that this was a you know a, a real change? Yeah, um, or if it was just trying to build some hype in the stock yeah i guess the difference between um that and a typical micro cap is that krm had a like a large cash balance i had 30 million dollars of cash sitting on their balance sheets so they had uh, plenty of opportunity um to to find a decent asset and they hadn't raised capital in i think it was about five years so um they had uh, plenty of opportunity to to buy a decent asset that had, you know, tier one potential. It wasn't going to be just and um, going through a bunch of the assets that they have and trying to find the, you know, flavor of the day kind of thing. Okay. So speak to me about when you initiated a position. Like how, how did you time your entry? I initiated my first entry and I actually ended up cutting um, that, which was at 4.8, I believe. That was in August. I was trying to... Uh, buy a position but it, there was just so much it was, it was still so heavy through that uh, first dip so I couldn't actually hold that position I ended up cutting it I first started looking for an entry when um, so it was 11th of August so it got down into that like 4 to 5 uh, 4.5 to 5 range and it was consolidating through there and that was kind of like at the, that 5 uh, resistance was kind of a long term um, like the it's been kind of ranging in that for, for you know about 4 years so I was trying to find a position that was below that six like res, and I thought that for that five range it was going to be a decent entry, but it, it got really heavy to, into the, that lower four area. So I ended up cutting the initial trade, and um, I ended up rebuying when it reclaimed um, that four point five. So that was my initial entry, and then started adding through that four point four five to five range. Um, that's where I got about half my position, and then. Uh, yeah, so then built through that five range. So I think I accumulated about 80% of the position from 4.5 to 5.2. Okay, so what was it about that price or that range of prices that you liked? Like what was it about the timing of this trade? So the cash balance, so that it was back to 4.2 cents just on their cash balance. So uh, if I would allowed myself... 15 to 20 percent from that initial cash balance to and that was sort of, i guess that was from my stop loss i was looking to stop out in that 4.2 to 3.9 range if it came down to that so i guess i didn't want to give i didn't want to buy it up too far in case they um this asset was um not acquired in a reasonable timeline and people just got sick of the story so i wanted to make sure that there was a level to work off that would allow us me to hold out and people could see value in it without um, having to acquire another asset. So I felt like that range was reasonably priced for the research reward that if they were to acquire the asset within, because they announced that they wanted to acquire the asset by end of year. So that left me about a three month period 
uh, before that. Uh, that was the expected acquisition. Um, at the start of your your comment there, you said something about 4.2. Uh, I don't remember the exact words you used. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, right. So 4.2 was the cash backing of the stock. So I figured if I'd bought, I was looking to buy about 4 million units in that range that if there was slippage through that area that I was hoping to get out but by 4.2 to 3.9 in that range. Okay, so what's a what's a cash back in at 4.2? Like what are you referring to there and how do you work that out? So um, the cash on the balance sheet, I believe, was about 30.5 million. So the market cap at 4.2 cents was about 30 million. So okay. it was pretty much being voted at zero um, enterprise value at that uh, 4.2 cent level. Understood. Okay. Yeah. So as you were buying it through this range, can you just go into some detail about how you were buying it? Yeah, sure. So at the time, there was there was a couple of levels that had like iceberg sellers on there. I guess um, when like a stock like this, it really hasn't uh, it's been ranging in a in a base for a long time, and it doesn't um, appear to be doing anything in, that it hasn't been doing the last couple of years. It's kind of like a stagnant stock people, I guess, are looking for any um, liquidity to sell out on. So there was a lot of like hidden um, orders on you know, iceberg orders that were allowing for me to actually find a fair bit of liquidity in that range. Um, so I probably, I probably wasn't, I wasn't sitting on the bid as much. I was more so taking liquidity through that range. So whenever liquidity was popping up, I was taking it. Okay. And you were just adding bits each day for what, a week or so there? Yeah, probably about a week, a week in that range um, before... Uh, it, it, it started just you could just feel in the tape that it started to um, lose the sellers they were becoming exhausted and it was it was getting harder and harder to accumulate in that range without pushing it higher okay and you may have already covered this but was there any fresh news um, while the stock was trading around this level yeah so there, there um, was a presentation that it was put out um, I believe that was um it was in September, so I'm just looking at the announcements now. So it was 30th of September, they released an um, announcement and that pushed it up about 5%. And in that announcement, they had uh, pretty well stated that they were looking for a PGE uh, nickel copper asset. So um, they're not exactly like a common type of deposit. So it sounded like they'd actually found an asset and they were doing the due diligence on it. So it sounded like it was pretty close. And they'd also announced that they wanted to complete the acquisition by end of year. So if they'd only really allowed themselves three months to complete the acquisition, I think that um it also it also um solidified that their new direction was to go down the um, exploration route rather than stick with the way lingo and find um so hopefully to find new resources there so i think it was a pretty clear change of um direction in that presentation that would have um, to anyone who would have read it would have seen that that was their uh new direction that they're going to take and i think you said you got about four million units um, between, was it 4.5 and 5.2-ish? Yeah, around about that, yeah. Yeah, roughly speaking. Why 4 million units? Can you talk to me about how you uh, determined your position size? Yeah, sure. So the 4 million units, I was pretty much just all based on what on what liquidity was in the book that I could sell, that I could hit out on. So say, for instance, that whatever reason the market was tanking, I was relying on that book um, that I'd be able to have liquidity to at least reduce my losses and and get out with a you know a reasonable loss, not something too drastic. So I was pretty much just it was all liquidity based at that stage, just making sure that I didn't get overextended in the trade and that I'd end up tanking it. I, I guess with these small caps, um, you really have to be cautious of liquidity because it, it can on a bad night in the states, for instance, you can look in the books. You know, there's nothing to rest on. So I'm just trying to – you're obviously going to have to take on risk by taking on that kind of position, but still just to make sure that there's enough liquidity in the book that if you want to hit out of that trade, that there is something to rest on. It's not guaranteed, but that's kind of – my positioning was based upon that. This might be a little bit hard to answer because obviously this was a few months ago now, but, you know, when you talk about there was liquidity in the book for you to fall back on, you know, you, you still had 4 million units. I'm kind of familiar with this stock and I, I know that there's not just, um, yeah. you know, 4 million uh, units on the bid most of the time. Uh, no, it is, 
a pretty thin stock during that time it yep. what you know most days it wouldn't do half a form it w- would do a oh, you know a million well. units <laughs> yeah 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 it was very You're thin pretty substantial time. size given the liquidity i think yeah like where was this liquidity that you're talking about um are you talking like as liquidity as a whole from say you know four and a half down to four or or yeah so i, I guess that would be allowing for whatever the book not that saying that the sale orders in the book would stay there if there was any downwards momentum in the stock but i guess if you got to base your position size on your conviction at first uh the liquidity in the book and then you know the 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 risk versus reward like if i'm going to have that bigger size well what's the potential upside what's the potential downside i get and i guess i've I found out that i figured that the risk through this level was worth taking on uh, down 4.2 is cash backing so if i was to have that slippage down through to say four, that the loss may be i think i allowed for about twenty thousand dollar loss through to the bottom end of that range so i guess you know that would that would have been if if it had slipped through to four to that 3.94 range we were talking like close to 52 week lows if not 52 week lows so and i felt i felt like it was just the resource rule was there to to add size through that range and in putting on this trade, uh, you just mentioned their potential upside. Like, did you have, you know, a price or an area in mind for where you might begin to, um, or, or where you anticipated that the stock could reasonably get to? Yeah, I guess I did have an expectation that that it, on a decent acquisition that, that we could expect in that twenty or thirty million dollar um, EV range, which would have uh, at four cents. We're talking at a thirty to forty million valuation, that eight to nine cents range. So I was allowing for that, but it, it actually um, it, most of the gains were had pre-acquisition. So it's one of those tricky ones where you're not expecting the stock to gain prior to the acquisition, but when it does, you're not quite sure if people have also queued onto the fact that this acquisition is likely and they're going to sell the news. So it's one of those. It, I actually ended up selling. Probably about half the half the position pre-acquisition because it had run about eighty percent prior to them announcing the actual yeah deal. Just before we get to that, um, just a step back. When you were putting on this position, you said there were quite a few like um, iceberg sellers, so reload sellers. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd lift an offer, it would reload. It was did that ever concern you? Like that there was someone who obviously had quite a lot to sell. You know they weren't showing their full hand. Yeah, was was that a concern at all? Uh, most of those iceberg sellers were about four point eight to four point nine. So at that range, the the, the stock's valuation is in that five to ten million range. Uh, it's uh, the research reward. I happily take that in that range, knowing that the caliber of the management team. I guess yeah, it's all like people are going to fight when there's no liquidity in a stock. For so long, you're going to have a lot of stale holders that are going to take any liquidity they can to get out of the stock. If they if they are holding you know 10 to 15 million unit position and there's liquidity and they've been looking to get out and they've been in the stock for you know I think the the six months prior the liquidity was terrible. So there's always going to be those stale holders looking to get out. Uh, if they if they know more than you do, it's you know I, I guess that's a risk you take. But yeah, I guess, I guess it didn't concern me too much based upon the valuation. If if I'd seen that at a higher valuation, I would be more concerned. But knowing where it was and and the risk off was, you know, quite low. So I was happy to take the liquidity there. Can you speak about how you managed the trade? So once it actually did start to move in your favour, I'm pretty sure you added to the position at some point. Yeah, I, I added through that five point five range. That was like a there was like a small little range there that ranged within. I think it was about a week, week and a half. And I was adding a top end of that range. But usually, the way I manage position is I'm I'm never really looking for like a multi bag of potential. I'd much prefer to like get size in a base or in a range, and then pretty much um, unwind my position into the breakout or or the trends. So I'm not someone who's trying to look for, you know, like three or four bags. So I pretty much started um, reducing my position from that six to seven range once it had um, taken out that um, resistance. So I wasn't, I wasn't adding above six. 
Okay. And did you ever cut any of the position into weakness, if you will? Like you started to reduce your position because you felt as though the trade may not be working? Yeah, there was actually the, the time when I cut my trade was actually the day of the acquisition. Um, it, it felt as if that like everyone had bought in for the acquisition and it was like a bit of a sell the news event. And I guess the market probably hadn't had time to actually evaluate the acquisition itself and people were looking for, because you've got those technical traders that are playing the break and then you've also got people that are buying for the acquisition Then if it doesn't, you know, gap up and run, they're likely going to sell. So I actually sold half my position on that acquisition date just because the book felt really heavy. And I think it actually like first, it matched actually in the red on the acquisition. So I, so I sold um, some position there um, and uh, reduced that position pretty significantly through that that during the day, just because the book felt did it, it really did feel heavy on that day, despite it being actually a pretty decent acquisition. What date was the acquisition? Um, it was the tenth of November. And you'll see what I'm talking about. The the range is um, 6.3 to 8.4. So it had like a huge ranging day. So I guess there was a lot of, um, you know, different traders and, and investors. And the, yeah, it was quite it was quite hard to gauge. The tape was very whippy and it was it was really hard to, um, I guess it was, it was just tricky to know how to how to manage the position and if it was going to be a sell the news event. And then it, it, like, you yeah, over the next few days, it will return back into that six to five range. So I guess that it's probably not one of my best uh, part of my trading is he's trying to sell, he's trying to work out how to sell those exponential moves and how to manage those kind of positions in those, in those very whippy ranges. Okay. And did you sell the lot that day? I sold the lot. Um, I believe I sold the majority of the position. I kept a small amount um, just to just to have like a, a small like core position, um, to see how it performed the next few days, just to make sure that I wasn't missing out on the effort did go on to you know see bigger gains the next few days that I wasn't missing out on the trade completely. But I did um, reduce majority of my position on that day. Okay, so you were selling into the news. Yeah, I big was, liquidity yeah. event. Yeah, exactly. And and when you like uh, I. In the days leading up, there really wasn't all that much. I think on average, we're doing about two to three million units a day. So there wasn't really all that much liquidity if you were to sell a bigger position. And I think that the position topped out at about seven million units. So I did have a fair bit of um, size on. And I guess you have to take those events as an opportunity to reduce size because there may not be liquidity big enough to, to get out on days ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so you kept a little bit on post that day. Yeah. When did you sell the, the last of it? I actually sold the position and then bought back in when it, um, when their liquidity had, uh, got, uh, when the, it started like reducing, the, like the, the range was getting smaller day to day and it was, their volume was dropping off. And I thought there may be an opportunity for a second trade in there. So I bought back on. So I'm just running through my execution. Uh, I bought back on. It was about the 22nd and 23rd, and it started uh, finding that seven cent base and looking like that it was, um, it had consolidated enough, and a lot of the hot money um, had came out of it. So I'd, I started buying back. It wasn't as big a position. I think I topped out at about two million units through that range. And then you sold that into, I presume, that spike into nine. Yeah, then I sold. I actually missed out on that blow off day. So I actually sold on the twenty fifth and missed the blow off day the next day. Um, which I think on the twenty, so on the twenty fifth, it topped out at nine point one, and then the following day it went to nine point five. But yeah, I sold um, in that eight point five to eight point seven range on on the twenty fifth of November. Yeah, nice one. Okay, okay. So the timeline of this trade, or as you just described, there was kind of two trades there but one one main one so you bought started buying in uh through september uh you sold all of it by kind of mid november ish um so what's yeah. the time on there like sort of two months hold time yeah roughly speaking yeah so the, the, i think the initial position was initiated in uh, late september yeah and then closed it out by by um yeah pretty much late november so just about two months yeah 
Now, just looking back on this, what were some of the things that you were pleased that you did, you know, things you felt you got right? And was there anything which you feel like you would like to improve on? Yeah, sure. Uh, in terms of doing something right, I guess it's, it's going hard in those A-plus setups. I find that, like, I probably only get, you know, one or two of these kind of opportunities each year where you find those stocks that meet all your criteria in terms of um, liquidity and, and opportunity but for resource reward and um, that suit you know, your sector and, and you know, that, that's what you define as your own personal A-plus trade. So I guess going harder and getting enough size on to make it significant enough um, to really count in terms of your P&L. So, yeah, I, I'm happy in the way I've positioned and sized and, and getting to that point where you're uncomfortable, um, which I think is probably one of those those tr- trades that are hard to find where you have enough confidence to get to that uncomfortable size to really push, you know, your ability in them. Yeah. Um, in terms of things I could have done wrong, I pretty much always have an issue trying to sell um, – these blow off high ranging tops. I, I usually miss the the um, the blow off. I always always sell in the lead up and then miss that. Usually, you know, that last you know two or three days in in a blow off move. Usually, you know, where you see those 50 percent gains, but the the previous thirty to fifty percent take you know a month. But I'm always I'm always all right, like um, you know, holding the trend. But when it becomes those exponential moves, I fail to hold long enough to really capitalize on them. So probably holding for a little bit longer and keeping more size so that I could have really like a, made more through that seven to nine cents range. And do you mind sharing how much you made in total PL on this trade? Yeah, so it was 160,000, um, 150,000 of which was the swing. And then it was about 10,000 of just scalping um, in smaller ranges. Yeah, that's outstanding, man. Well done. Thank you. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Um, Let's keep it just a shorter episode. I know we could um, keep going, but uh, if someone wants to find out more about you or follow you on Twitter, um, would you like to share your handle? Yeah, no worries. I believe it's chase.galbraith, C-H-A-S-E dot G-A-L-B-R-A-I-T-H. Okay. I think. Excellent. All right. Well, I will pop a link to that in the show notes as per always. Um, Yeah, Chase, appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing this. Thank you, man. Thanks very much, Andy. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. Chat with Traders.